Is that sound, sound coming through, Darren? Hello. I'll give you a couple of weeks here. All right. Um, now, I can t now I can tell I'm coming through. Good evening, everybody. It is good to see you all. Thank you for taking time to come out in the evening. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, I really enjoyed my time this morning. Uh, this is, like uh, Peter said, it's the first time in La Crete. And uh, it just reminds you how big Canada is, <laughs> right? It, you know, and we still have a long ways to go even north from here. And yet, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. So we're, we're just uh, glad to come. We're encouraged to, to know that the gospel is being preached in your churches and that the Bible is important to you. And so I think uh, when, with that in mind, it's just, a, uh, it's, it's just fun to be able to be part of that. And I hope that as I share with you, that I'm actually going to be encouraging you and in your walk with the Lord. That this will be a time when we look at, at the Bible, we look at these people that God, by his sovereign design, has put into the scriptures, and how much they will speak to us. And uh, just a little background, so this is my wife Esther here. Uh, she, she grew up north of Hay, or in Hague, north of Saskatoon. I grew up in West Africa. My parents were missionaries, and so I didn't come back to Canada to stay until I was 18. And... Uh, but my, my roots are actually Saskatchewan. Uh, my parents were from Saskatchewan. And so that, there's that heritage that I've, I've experienced as well. And when I got married to Esther, I had no idea how many relatives I was going to be gaining. <laughs> uh, there's quite a few up in this area, too. Though we, I, you know, I have hardly met any of them, but uh, who knows? I think we're going to get to connect with some this time here. So it's great to be here with you. Just to get started, I... I the, I'll give you the context of how this, this course got designed. I was asked to teach this course a few years ago, and I was pondering, how do you, how do you talk about Bible characters? What, what would be a good way to approach it to, uh, so that it would be meaningful and practical? And so a lot of it started out of my own observation of the world around me and what was happening in Christians' lives. And realizing that in our, in our Christian world, those who proclaim and or claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, that we are some, watching some do so well for the course of their life, finishing well. And then in my context where I work at a Bible college, I've worked with college students now for over 28 years, um, to see even some of those young people, many of them going on, serving the Lord, but some falling away. And then all the whole range from 80 or 90 years old to young, young people. And, and so it prompted the question, how do we guard our hearts and finish well? So when we meet the Lord, he can say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. And, and the Bible is just filled with these people who were just like us. We sometimes see them as this distant name that we've read in the Bible many times, like Joseph or Daniel or Abraham or Esther or, you know, you just go through the list. There's hundreds and hundreds of Bible characters that are, by God's design, inserted into the Scripture record. And they were just like us. They had the same struggles. These were real people. And the thing about the Bible is it doesn't speculate. It just tells it like it is. The good, the bad, and the ugly, when it records what we need to know about these people that God has chosen to reveal to us so we can learn from them today. And so in this time that we have this week, I'm going to come back frequently to this question, how are you doing? How am I doing? Are we guarding our hearts? How do we do this? How can we learn from these people from the scriptures what their experiences were that we can take and apply? The good lessons, the things they did right, and then also learn from the things they did poorly. And we know there's some massive uh, disasters of people in the Scripture because they lost focus and they made decisions that ended up ruining them. So this is, the, this is the kind of the focus of the course and, or this, these classes that we're going to be, be doing while I'm 
uh, teaching these evenings. Now, I've given you a handout which has all my, or the majority of my, my slides at least, and it just makes it simple for you to follow along. You can add notes or thoughts as you do if, you, if you're a note taker. If not, you can just track with me and it's, it's something that you can, can use. One of the things about this course, I never even thought of it this way until I was teaching it to, to college students and uh, when somebody pointed out here, actually this is like getting a whole bunch of, of Sunday school lessons that you can turn into, into teaching Sunday school because it's just that nature you, as you take it. And if this is helpful, maybe you teach Sunday school. Maybe this is a resource that might be helpful to you. I don't know. But it really is, uh, it, it's really enjoyable to learn from these people. Practical theology. The Bible was given to us for our transformation, not for our information. We have to remember that. We're giving this information so it'll transform us. That's the goal. Not just that we increase in knowledge, that it actually changes our lives. We have to always remember that when we read the Bible, how is it speaking to us? How does it help me understand what God is communicating to us? And I, I just want you to know, I welcome discussion, insights. You have things that you've learned, that we have good dialogue here. Please interject if you have things you want to add to us, uh, add to this discussion, and things you'll pick up that maybe I haven't mentioned or haven't thought about. But uh, please feel free to do that. I'm just going to read this because I think it helps to set the stage. The Bible is very transparent how it portrays the people whom God chooses to put into the biblical record for us to learn about. It is often easy to think of them in a distant way, disconnecting them from our lives, when in fact they were people just like us, the same struggles, challenges, failures, and successes that we face. It is another example why the Bible is so relevant to us today. You know, people like to say, well, this is so old, it's not relevant. You will not find a more relevant book than the Bible. It, is, it just nails things that we need to know today that we face today, and it helps us cope with life and to grow in our relationship with God. It's so relevant. So don't ever listen to that. It's not relevant. It is so relevant. And, I, and it's, that's why it's so, it's so important to study it. The key question is this. Are we willing to study these characters and be humble enough to learn from them and in turn grow in our walk with God? Will we, will we be willing to learn from their failures? Some of them were monumental and from their successes, noting how they truly trusted and followed God and how he took care of them. We will seek to learn lessons and details about each character, but the most important challenge and recurring theme in this course is to reflect on their lives and commit ourselves to finishing well for the honor and glory of God. Many of the people finished poorly because they lost focus and turned from God. Finishing well requires being intentional to guard our hearts and to be proactive in keeping our walk with God fresh and vibrant in the midst of the turmoil of life that can so quickly draw us away from God and His blessings. We can get distracted so easily, can't we? And, and so it's, it's an intentionality that we have to do. We have to actually think, I have to choose to guard my heart. I have to choose to take steps to protect myself from wandering away. Otherwise, inadvertently, without even realizing it, we may find ourselves getting distant from God, hard, our hearts getting hard because we haven't paid attention to doing business with our heart and making sure that it, we're doing the business that needs to be taking place here. So that's my prayer. I, I really, I've prayed lots about this and the way the Holy Spirit works, it's interesting when you're preaching or teaching or conversing with people. When you invite the Holy Spirit to speak to people, in, the, in a group like this, there's going to be people who are, there's going to be one or two statements that may just say, you know what, that's what I need to hear today. Has that happened to you? That's happened to me so many times. All of a sudden, the, the speaker, the teacher will say something, said, oh, that's what I need to hear. And that's the work of God meeting us where we need to be met. So I don't know what your needs are. I'm really quite clueless. And I want to speak the truth of Scripture. And as I do that, may the God, uh, Spirit of God encourage you, maybe where you just need some encouragement today. And, in, and as we continue in this, when I teach the Bible class, this, this class to Bible college students, we're only taking a portion of it. This is not the whole course. One of the things I, ta I go right away and talk about, what is the difference between a cultural Christian and a biblical Christian? And it's a very, very important question that we need to ask because sadly, 
in our world, those who go to church, who claim to be Christians, there are some who do it for cultural purposes, but have actually probably never experienced rebirth. What it becomes, to become a child of God where I make the decision to believe in Jesus Christ, accept his forgiveness, and become his child, and take on that I am now his child, and I know who, who my, that I am a part of the family of God. And, and again, I'm going to refer to my class a little bit. I will challenge students on this. Are you playing the game of being a Christian? Or are you the real deal? Do you understand? We have to come to grips with this because I think there's a lot of people fooling themselves and saying, well, I do all the churchy things, but actually, maybe, there's not actually the evidence of a transformed life that only becoming a child of God does for us. So it, it, I, I, I want us to be careful to just be sure that we know our relationship with the Lord is in the right place and that we know He is our Father, that we are His, child, His children. And I think it's important to just know the difference between that. So being t- for t- uh, intentionally proactive, as we assess these characters, we, and we talk about them, their sex, successes and their failures, assess your own walk with God. To me, you don't teach a class like this well, coming back to the question that I have to ask myself, that you need to ask yourself, what does this mean to me? Where am I tracking in all this? And as we do that, it's amazing how God can help us. Oh, I need to grow in this area. I need to be intentional and to actually have a plan of action. Are you using the gifts and talents that God has given to you for his honor and glory? How well do you know yourself? Are you living a double life out of either ignorance or willful disobedience or or both? And again, these are things I always pose every time I teach the class because I want people to wrestle with reality, make sure we understand it. Do you believe it is possible to finish well? And will you commit yourself to God and take the necessary action to stay true to Him? And often we, sometimes, we don't get our theology straight, or we don't, we, we talk about theology, which is our understanding, view of God and His Word, but we don't actually come to grips with what it's really saying to us until maybe something very hard comes along. I remember teaching this to a class one time, and I was challenging the students, make sure that you know where you stand on who God is, his goodness, his sovereignty, how he works, that we don't understand a lot of things that take place in our lives that are hard, but a sovereign God does and knows what he has his purposes. So you have your theology straight before you get into tough situations where all of a sudden we haven't thought through, well, what does God think about this? I remember I just taught this, this lesson, and I was about four weeks later, I can't remember exactly the, the, the timeline, and one of the guys in my class lost his best friend in an accident. And then the reality of our theology kicks in, doesn't it? When we have serious hardship, and then how we know who God is and our belief and trust in him becomes tested. Can I trust God? when these things happen. And it can be all a whole multitude of things, but that's why I want to encourage all of us, and remind, remember, I'm speaking to myself, that we make sure that we have a good understanding of who God is, so that when things come, we have a rock of foundation to hang on to, to get through the, the deep waters that come our way, that we don't often understand, and to know that God is in control of that. Any questions or, or input before we keep moving here? So just as we, before we move into the, to the characters, um, keep this in mind. Watch for the thread of the gospel in each character. Watch for the hand of a sovereign God who knows the beginning from the end and will accomplish his purposes. Do you believe that? Watch for the evidence of walking by faith or lack thereof. We are told in Scripture that the just shall walk by faith, and that's trusting God even when we don't know what's going on half the time. But can we trust him even with the unknown? And an, and an element so crucial to long-term healthy relationship with Jesus. So keep these in mind. All right, we're going to take a, a, a unique look at Jonah here. I'm going to let you watch a little, a little video here. Uh, 
I'll, I'm going to put this here. The story of Jonah. Long, long ago, there was a man named Jonah who lived a good life and always obeyed God's laws. He thought of himself as a true man of God. Jonah was a hard worker. Through his labels, he was able to buy chickens and a donkey and a goat. One day, God spoke to Jonah. Jonah, huh? Jonah, who is that? My earring ditch. Jonah, I am the Lord of God. There is a city called Nineveh far away. It is filled with people that have become wicked lives. They have forgotten about kindness and helping others. Why are you telling me about them, God? Because I want you to go there and tell those wicked people I am going to destroy them in their city because of their wicked ways. Ye Yes, Lord, I will go, but they won't listen. They're evil. The more Jonah thought about it, the more uneasy he became. That night, Jonah did not sleep very well. No, it'll hurt me. Nineveh is so far. They'll laugh at me. No! Jonah was denying God's plan for him. Nineveh? Those people don't even know about God. Why should they believe me? They might even try to kill me. The more Jonah thought about those wicked people, the more frightened he became. He decided to run away from God. That very night, he packed his clothes and hurried to the seaport. That the next morning, he saw a ship that was getting ready to sail far across the sea. Who? Oh, who goes there? A uh, Jonas. Sure. Uh, please, Captain, let me come with you. I'll give you all my money for a place on your ship. Huh. Looks like trouble to me. Yes, I wonder what he's running away from. Well, I guess we can find a place for you. Jonah boarded the ship and hid deep in the hold, as far away from God as he could. At last, he saw the anchor being drawn up onto the deck. At last, we're heading out to open sea. God will never find me now. I'm going to have a new life for myself. As soon as the ship was far, was far from land, God sent a storm, for no one can hide from God. Sent God sent great gusts flying over the sea and waves tossing over the ship. Men, on deck, we're taking on overboard. Captain, we're sinking. We need to overboard the ship. Throw the cargo overboard. And all the sailors went under the went went inside the ship. Look, he's sound asleep. We need all hands on deck. Deck. Hey, wake up! Wake up! Come, we have no time to wake him now. As the sailors closed the door, Jonah War fell asleep. That uh, outside, it was dark as night. The sailors began to throw the cargo overboard. Jonah ran upon deck. Only one thing will save the ship. Stop! Stop! You must throw me into the water instead. What are you saying? We can't throw an innocent man into this angry sea. Listen, God has sent this storm to punish me. Punish? Why? I tried to run away from him, and now he has found me. If we throw him over now, he'll surely drown. But the wind and the waves are too much for us. We have no choice. The sailors grabbed Jonah and threw him into the sea. The sea became calm. Down, down, down into the sea sank Jonah. Gasping and nearly drowning, but God was not yet fi finished with Jonah. He sent a big fish to swallow Jonah in one gulp. 
Jonah found himself in the stomach of a great fish. Oh, it's so dark in here. What will become for me now? Maybe God will still hear me. Jonah turned to the Lord. Lord, thank you for saving me. Inside the fish, Jonah prayed for three days. I'm sorry I tried to hide from you. Please let me out of this terrible prison. I will do as you commanded. God heard Jonah and knew he had changed. He made the fish spit out Jonah onto the land. Thank you, merciful Lord, for delivering me safely to land. Now, Jonah... Go to Nineveh and tell those wicked people I am going to destroy them. Yes, Lord, I'm listening. I'm on my way. Jonah entered the city, calling to the people. People of Nineveh, listen to me. The Lord God will destroy you and your city. Stop your wicked ways. What? Did you hear that? You have angered God. He says the Lord is angry with us. Why? What have we done? You are vain and selfish. Maybe if we change our ways, we've been too concerned with our fancy clothes. You are greedy and unkind. We should share our riches with the poor. You are wasteful as the poor star. We've been eating too much and not caring about our hungry neighbors. It's true. We've been selfish. God will punish you. We must all pray to the Lord for forgiveness. The people heard Jonah pray to God and be, and began maining their ways. Meanwhile, God, Jonah climbed a hill above the city and sat down to watch God dis- dis- destroy it. He waited and waited I feel like a fool. All my work has wasted. God is not destroying Nineveh. Jonah. Yes, Lord. Jonah, will you never learn my love? My love is great. It is greater than my anger. And it is for all my creatures. Didn't I give you another chance? Yes, you did. Now I am giving the Ninevites another chance. Go now, Jonah, and try to love as I do. Then you will be a true man of God. Yay for God! He has forgiven us! Yay! Hurrah! Hooray! So Jonah began his long journey home and tried to love as God had taught him. The end. We're not going to talk about Jonah anymore than what you just heard. <laughs> but she gives a really good summary of, of Jonah, one of the many, many characters in the Bible, a fascinating person to study. But we're not going to study him. That's just a good introdu- introduction. This is a personal reflection just as we go to the first character, which is Daniel. How much do you recognize the centrality of the gospel, the work of God, Jesus in the Bible? How much do you recognize that he is a a critical part of every uh, part of your life? And you can do this if you want, but in your your notes, you can just jot a few thoughts on that because we'll periodically stop and I'll get you to reflect on what we've been talking about just to ask, okay, how is this affecting me? And what what does this have to do with me? So I'll give you just a minute or two to reflect on it and then we're going to move on.
only happen if we live well daily. It's one thing to look ahead to what's, what's happening, like what's ahead in our lives. But if we really want to finish well, we have to do the business of today and ask the questions, how am I doing today? How's my walk with the Lord today? And work and give that attention to making sure it is where it's supposed to be. We're going to be looking at this section for tonight. We're not going to get all these characters. I think I'm going to have to leave Ruth out tonight. But um, this, this section tonight is to look at those who've started well and who've finished well. There's lots of them in Scripture who, who started their, their walk with God and they just lived that right to the end of their lives. Some of them are quite young. We get to Stephen. He was a young man when he was martyred. But he, he, he was faithful from start to finish. And this, it's important for us to get this because if we, if we see no hope of being able to do that journey, it gets too discouraging. But the Bible's filled with hope in the side that you can journey with God, have your relationship continue to grow, and to finish your season well. And, and so be encouraged with that. When we look at Daniel... One of the things that we're going to do, and, I, and just to give you a little bit of context here, each character we're going to talk about, we're not going to plumb the depths on them. I'm just going to highlight a few key things about them. We're going to talk about them, the lessons we can take away from them, because otherwise we could spend almost the whole week on one character quite easily, I think, especially one like Daniel. So I'm just going to introduce you to him, some of the, the critical things the Bible says about him, and then we ask the question, what can we take away from Daniel's life? What can we take away? And that, that is, of course, the whole point of it. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Daniel, and we're going to be in chapter 1. <clears throat> now, here's the context to Daniel, just so you, you, you have it. And again, I don't know exactly how much detail to go through with this, but you, the, the story starts with them as these young men. Judah has been, has been defeated. Nebuchadnezzar has taken a lot of people into captivity, into Babylon. That's the context of where the book starts. And we're given a little bit of that background of Daniel right at the beginning, who these young men were. And, and he is absolutely a remarkable person in the Scriptures. And if we want to look for somebody to model our lives after and say, you know what, here's a character that... I want to kind of model what he demonstrated. Boy, Daniel is a great example to study and to understand because his life of faithfulness. And he was faithful in incredibly hard circumstances. They were brought into this heathen land where it must have been just unbelievably unfavorable to being a Jew and his faith and his trust in the true God. And so this, he comes in with this. And let's get some context here. I'll read some of the verses, and I'd like you to, to help read some of these passages as we get to them. But I'm going to start in chapter 1. And, and so you get a bit of the picture here. In, so starting in verse 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful king in the world at that time. Massive, massive control of a good part of the world. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the house of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. It says, Then the king commanded Eshpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So these were hand-selected young men that they were going to train in the ways of the Chaldeans. And the king assigned them a daily portion of food that, they, that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. And they were educated, they were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. And among these were Daniel... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Meshach he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. So here's these men. And we don't talk about his friends as much, but they do factor into the story very much because of their courage. And 
uh, just, just to start with, in verse 8, I think we get a real insight into who Daniel is. And it says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or the wine that he drank. I think that statement, he resolved himself, was he made a decision he was not going to be, he was not going to bend to what he felt was wrong. Do we get a little bit of insight into this man Daniel is with that statement? I think we're introduced right away. Here's a person with resolve, and right away we're introduced to a quality that we should be considering. Say, man, I'm I resolved in what I believe, and I resolved to do what God's called me to do, because Daniel did that. So let's read a few more verses here. Um, I wonder if somebody would be willing to read from verse 8. Um, verse 8 to verse 16, I think. No, verse 20, please. Uh, would somebody want to read those verses, please? Read nice and loud so everybody can hear, if you would, please. 8 to 20. But then we're told in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king uh, delicacy, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel to the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord and king who has appointed your food and drink and drink. For why should you see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, uh, Ananiah, Mishael, and uh, not named later, no. Please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. And let our appearance be a mind before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacy, and as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. At the end of the ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacy just. The steward took away their portion of delicacy and wine, and they were to drink, and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge, skill in all literature and wisdom, and that will have understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, then the king interviewed them. And among them all none, um, among them all none was found, like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding of which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the scholars who were in Israel. Okay, thank you. So, you get the picture, Daniel's been brought in and his friends, they're faced with a test right away that if you take this kind of food, then this is what they believe would prepare them to be the wise men, the, the whatever the standards that the king was expecting of them, but it went against his conscience, he resolved not to do it. Tell me, tell me, just get some feedback here, what does this say about Daniel and where his walk with God was as we're introduced to him here? What does it say about him? He knew what he believed, yep. And it just shows up right away, doesn't it? And here's another thing. Look about how he dealt with, the, with his captors. What did it show about him? What did he, what did he do in responding to this thing? Did he just, just did he just go pout in the corner and say no? Yeah. He, absolutely. And and now, okay, there is another but how did he respond? So that's exactly right. Now his response to them, well, how did what, what can we learn from how he dealt with that eunuch? 
Yeah. Yeah, it was like, there, it showed a lot of wisdom, didn't it? That he didn't say, I'm not going to, to drink it, but will you test us? And, he, and so it showed this care for this eunuch, because this guy could lose his head over this. And he gives him an option and said, now let's see what God does with this. I think it showed tremendous wisdom in a young man to even take that approach. His courage to stand, you knew right away that he was not going to bend. We find this out from Daniel. And so you're always curious, I think, okay, if you had never read Daniel before, what would the end story be? What would his story be? Well, we know where he started and the courage that he had right through the thread of his story, what was just said that he knew what he believed and he wasn't going to bend on it. Okay, let's, let's keep going. Let's see a little bit more about Daniel. This is we see this incident. There's more. Nebuchadnezzar now has a dream, and he is asking the people not only to, to, tell, to interpret this dream and actually tell them what the dream was. Like they, there, there's all this, there, he wants this interpretation, so he calls all these wise men to come forward. And, man, these guys are in big trouble. Okay, so let's read, uh, let's try Daniel 2, 17 to 19. Would somebody read that, please? And Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, his companions, and they, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish the rest of the wise men of Babylon. You know, do you mind just reading the end of 23? I think it's important to hear that, uh, that part where he talks, where he, he prays. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in the night vision, so Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons, he removes pains and raises up pains. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep. He, he reveals deep the secret things and knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God and my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we ask of you, for we have made known to us the king's demand. I think you can hardly blame those, those wise men for saying, how are we supposed to know what you dreamt? It's one thing to try and interpret it, but also tell me what I dreamt as well, which is what the, what the context is. And so it has to be a miracle from God. And then in that prayer, I think we're, we're just given this insight into the sovereignty of God. You think about even our world today, what we're facing politically all around the world, and to realize, you know, God, he removes kings. God removes kings. He sets up kings. He's in charge of that. He, these people think they're in charge. God only allows them there for the season that he's going to allow them to be there. And, and we need to be confident that Daniel recognizes this, and then he's given the answer, and he gives the interpretation to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, let's jump ahead now to, to another well-known story, and this is now when Nebuchadnezzar... And it's, he, he makes this golden image, and he commands everybody to bow down to this. Now, where Daniel was this in, in, at this time, the Bible doesn't say that he must have been away, as we assume. But they're faced with this thing, you're going to bow down, or you're going to die. He's going to be thrown in this furnace. That was the option. And everybody was supposed to celebrate and do all these things. But these three men... So a tremendous courage. So somebody read 16 to 18 of chapter 3, please. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, will, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the bold image which you have set up. Yes. Talk about courage for these men to say that to him, eh? And here's a, another lesson we have to grasp, pull out of this. It wasn't God has to save us, but he can if he wants to. And if he doesn't, it's okay. That was the depth of their trust and faith in God that they had. How many times in our own lives do we come to that place, right? We're wondering... 
You know, we want God to do something the way we want it. And we have to be open to say God has a different plan in mind, but it doesn't change his sovereignty or his, his goodness, the way he's going to do. And in this case, he saved these men. And, and, and Nebuchadnezzar is just fabricated because he looks into the furnace. It was so hot that the people who took him there are dying. And there's four men walking in there and un, completely untouched by these flames because God is a miracle-working God. And he chose to save them. And Nebuchadnezzar once again is encountered by their testimony something about who God is. And, that, and eventually we're going to see when we get to the place where he actually loses his sanity that we find out finally God gets through to him and he realizes who is the actual king. Now we're not going to talk about that today. I want you to jump to one more familiar story and that's the lion's den. And there again, um, I'll read verse 10 there. It's, so Daniel has been in power. He's, he's been elevated to a very high position in the country. He has people jealous of him. They're trying to find wrong with him, and they can't find anything. And the only thing they can find wrong with him is that he, every, he's so predictable in the time he spends with God. And so they find a way. They make this decree by Darius, and he makes this decree without thinking about it. And then they go back, and he realizes it's his friend Daniel that he's actually con he's, he's, uh, condemned. And now he can't go back on his word. And says, and, it, and verse 10 of chapter 6, it says this, And when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had his windows in, an, uh, in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got, down on his knees three he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks to God, gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. That threat did not change his walk with God one tiny bit. He just kept doing what he's doing. Oh, you got this, this is just powerful uh, challenge to us and how important it is to keep our walk with the God, or God daily, that we stay fresh in our walk with God, that we don't, do, we don't abandon it when things get busy, but that we st stay fresh with him. When I think of Daniel, his, his example of this, one of the reasons I think his story is so strong all the way through is he had a daily walk with God. What a message for us, isn't it? You know, I don't know, I assume there, there's a sewer, there's a big sewer for the Crete someplace. And when we avoid and we don't spend time in the, the fresh sweetness of the Bible, talking with God, why don't we go take and fill our water bottle? And I've done this as an illustration. Filled up a water bottle with that kind of water from the sewer. I said, is this what you want to be drinking do we really want to drink from this? Because when we stay out of the Word, we hardly ever open our, our Bibles, hardly ever talk to the Lord. We're allowing other stuff that's not healthy for us fill us and then ruin us. But what we can do is drink of this. I think this is good water. <laughs> but we drink the fresh spring of the Bible and the Scriptures and let it fill us day by day. And it renews us and it keeps us focused. And as soon as we neglect that, we become susceptible to walking away from him and our hearts getting hard. And it's talking with God. Our conversation with God, when, when the Bible talks about praying without ceasing, it's not that we're head bowed talking to God 24 hours a day. But it's just this, a relationship that we have with God that is so good that we just talk to him. It just naturally comes to him. We talk to him about what's going on in our day-to-day -day living. It's not a, a formal prayer meeting that this has to take place. But we converse with him and we talk with him. And I have to believe that Daniel had this relationship where God was just involved with his day-to-day -day life. Is God interested, by the way, in our day-to-day -day things? Even the little tiny things that we think, ah, he doesn't care about this. Does he care about the little things? He does. He cares about the little things. He cares about the big things. He wants us to have fellowship with him. And I believe that's one of the great takeaways from Daniel is in the most un un inhospitable environment. He stayed true to God. Sometimes we can say, it's just so hard, God, I can't do it here. I'm in a workplace. I worked in some construction sites that were so dark that you just, it was just like 
oh, I just give up. It's, there's no point trying to walk for God here because I can use the excuse it's too hard. We can't use that excuse. Daniel being a great example, your circumstances should not dictate or my dictate to me how I walk with God. But it should be reflected in that my relationship with God doesn't change wherever I am or what the circumstances are. And I think that's one of the beautiful stories of Daniel. Let me read the end of, of the story here, or this particular one. It says here in Daniel chapter 6, he says, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, this is the king speaking, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I have done no, been done no harm. And he was exceedingly glad. And what happened to those people who, <laughs> who set him up? What happened to them? Uh, they became lunch, right? Yeah, they were destroyed. I grew up in Africa. When I was little, I don't remember this. But it was in the season when you could still hear lions roaring in the distance where we lived. Mom and Dad could hear them. And if you've seen lions in, in the wild, you know these are, these are ferocious things. Try to imagine this. He's surrounded by this. And they didn't touch him because God shut their mouths. <laughs> God protected him. Isn't that awesome? And God's in control. And Daniel's faithful. Well, we won't finish the story of Daniel with the writing on the wall. But right through the very end, he finished well. His record is one of faithfulness to the end. Now, I want to point this out. This is not in your notes. But I want us to just keep this in mind as we look at the other characters as well. Daniel clearly understood that he was called by God to live in this place to serve him. He understood his calling. Do you know each one of us has a call in our life? Every one of us. If we say we don't, we're mistaking our understanding of how God works. Each of us has a call and purpose to serve God for his purposes here. When we understand that calling, then it leads to conviction. See, Daniel had full conviction in, in his belief in God, didn't he? That was obvious. He had deep conviction. He was called. He had conviction. And I believe as I was that understanding of his calling, his conviction, it, that allowed him to have the courage to live the way he was supposed to live. And I think if we're trying to think, how do we stay the course? Then remind yourself that God has called me. Be sure of it. If God's called you to serve in this community, if you're a farmer or a businessman, or you serve in the church, or you serve in the school, wherever God calls you, not God, that's, and you have a family, and you know, this is what God's called me to do in this season, and you're, you know that, then give yourself wholeheartedly to it. And, and, then, and allow yourself to be under the, live under that conviction that God is true, that he has you here for a purpose. See, in my context of working with college students, this is where there's so many struggles I find with young people is, oh, what's God called me to do? And you're overcomplicating it. Be obedient. Is, are you where God's wanting to ask him, is this where you want me to be? That I'm going to serve you here well, no matter what it is. And if you have that conviction that God's called you, then I believe out of that flows the courage to do. And we'll see each one of these characters, this process. They understood their calling, their conviction that God is true, that he's true, to, that he's true to his word, led to them have the courage to be known for what they're known for today. Here we are, thousands of years studying their story. So the lessons from Daniel, I think these are great takeaways. Where we live, the difficult circumstances at the workplace is not an excuse for not following Jesus. So I, don't, I think it's important for us never to use that excuse. I was in a... When, when I, between my Bible college years, the, this was in the early 80s, the economy was terrible. Some of you will remember this. I think the interest rates were like 20 or 22 percent. Like, if you understand that, you know that's not good. And jobs are so hard to find. And I was, I was, uh, I finally got a job as a dishwasher in this all night joint in Saskatoon, and it was a rough place. And they gave me the graveyard shift from 11 o'clock to 7 in the morning. 
And it's as dark a place as I've ever worked. And I've worked in some dark places where these people desperately needed Jesus. You know what my problem was? I thought I was too good to be a dishwasher. So I hated that job. And there's no way those people watching me would not have known that. I worked hard for them. I never gypped them on hard work. And I was so worried what people thought about me. I tell you, called by God to a mission field, if I would understand that's my call to be a missionary right there, these guys desperately know about Jesus. And I was worried what people thought about me. Instead of being a dishwasher for Jesus, it would have been a celebration, right? I was so proud that I didn't want to tell people what I did. And of course, without, without understanding my calling and not the conviction that God would place me there to use me, I didn't have the courage to speak to these people. And I look back with great regret to that job because I think I missed an opportunity. But that story has been one I've used to tell students. When you go to work this summer, will you be a light for Jesus? You be a light knowing that he's called you. It may be a really hard place to work. It may be a great place to work. Understand that God's called you for this season to do this. And you have that conviction that this is God's leading and now serve with courage. And the Lord taught me some good things. Living a life of faith, the Bible's so clear on walking, on the importance to walk by faith. That is trusting God with the unknown. It's trusting the things we don't understand, but knowing that he's in control. And Daniel modeled that so well. And then what I said earlier, guarding our hearts requires a daily walk with God. We want to stay fresh, stay in the Word, stay in fellowship. By the way, it's, it's, it's staying in the Word, it's talking with God, but it's also staying in fellowship with fellow believers. God has designed us to encourage one another. That's why the coming together is so important. And friendships where we spur another, one another on to good works and to serving God because we care enough to care and do something about it. And I think Daniel, you know, I look at his friends, that he had that support around him as well. That's, not, that's a, a noteworthy thing as well. But these are takeaways from this lesson. Any comments before we take a break? Am I missing, is there something you'd like to add to this that you picked up from Daniel that all of us should hear? This inspires me, by the way. When I'm talking to you, <laughs> I'm not talking to you like, you need to hear this, I don't need to hear this. Oh man, this is every time I talk about this, I need to this reminder of the goodness of God modeled in the life of a faithful servant like Daniel. Any thoughts? To add to thinking of uh, chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not comply. Now, I think that's a very good principle to carry. You know, he, he kind of knew in what kind of circumstance he would be stepping into. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it requires courage. It does. Good lesson for us, isn't it? As we face all kinds of situations in our life that are maybe, you know what? Am I going to take a stand or am I, am I going to be fearful? Or am I resolving? I know this is going to be a hard place. So wonderful lesson from Daniel. Okay, let's take a, a five, seven minute break and then we'll go to another Bible character.
All right, let's uh, look at uh, Esther. Again, we'll, we'll just look at very briefly at this, this lady, uh, a really neat story in the Bible record. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Esther. So just a little bit of context here. So King Ahasuerus is putting on a banquet and he makes some rather foolish decisions. His, his wife Vashti, the queen, refuses to come on display and he bans her. See, we don't understand the culture that day very well. It was a, I think life was very cheap and it, wasn't, it just wasn't uh, valued the way we might look at it in certain ways here today. But now he's looking for a new queen, and this is where Queen Esther comes into play. She's a virgin who's brought in to be one of those who might be chosen to become the new queen. That's the story behind, the, er, that's the start of the book of Esther. And, uh, but it's, of course, it's a way bigger story because Esther is a Jew. And Mordecai, her uncle, has, has thwarted a, a, a plot for the king, and there's, it's kind of this story building. Now she's, she's chosen as, as the queen, and that's where I want to pick it up is here, is when Haman, who is one of the head people under Ahasuerus, decides he's jealous of Mordecai, and he wants to have a chance to kill all the Jews. And so this is where this plot begins in chapter 3. Haman plots against the Jews, and he puts this thing to the king, and the king actually d does, put a, does actually put a decree out that's going to allow them to destroy the Jews. Now we're going to pick it up here in chapter 4. Okay, so Esther comes onto the scene, or she's in the scene, but she's already in, in the story, and Mordecai comes to her and says, you're going to need to do something here for the, for the salvation of your people. And you have to understand, for even to come in front of the king without his bidding, he could just have her killed just like that. That's just the power he had. That was the way they thought and did. So her, even her going in front of the king was, was a, a, a highly risky thing for her to do. So let's start here in verse 4 of chapter 4. And she agrees to help, she agrees to go to the king under the, the coaxing of Mordecai. And so let's read here. Is there someone who would like to read that passage, 4 to 17 of Esther? Chapter 4, 4 to 17. Someone who hasn't read yet? Her maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai, Take his, and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what, what and why this was. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of, to the king who has not been called, he has but one law put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these thirty days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to Esther, to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. 
Yet you know whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Yet, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for the three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all Esther commanded him. Thank you. So you, you sort of get the picture drawn there that Esther has to take action now if she's going to save her people. And, and Mordecai is reminding her of her responsibility. But I think the, the courage of this lady is really noteworthy. Where she understood, I really understood her calling. It's starting to come to light that God's called her for such a time as, and place as this. That God was going to use her. Do you see the, the threat of redemption in this as well? See God's salvation. How it's actually, there's this picture of, of, of Jesus coming and, and on our behalf where Esther has to now intervene on part of her people at high risk to her own health. And so she had to decide to go and she says, if I perish, I perish. So she plans this banquet in chapter 5. Remember, Haman hates Mordecai. He makes these gallows to hang him. So this is all planned. And then this banquet takes place. And, and when Esther reveals the plot to the king, like he said, who, what, what's going on? He wants to know. And when he reveals, she reveals the plot of Haman to destroy her people, Haman is now destroyed because the anger of the king now turns to Haman. 7-1. Let me just read these. 7-1 to 6. So the king and Haman went into a feast with, the, with Esther. On the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again sent to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, I have found, if I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely slaves, men and women, I would have been silent. But our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? Who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. And then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Now Haman was sitting there expecting to be honored. Because the king had asked him, like, What would you do to somebody you really want to honor earlier? And he lays out what would be a great honor, and he does it for Mordecai instead, because he, he finds out that Mordecai has saved his life. So he's sitting there smugly. I just tried to visualize this in a play. I'm not really a dramatic person, but it must have been <laughs> quite the scene when she gets to the truth of what's going on here, and poor Haman absolutely knows this is the end for him because the king is furious. And so the very thing that he had planned for the Jews, for Mordecai, the gallows, he's hanged there, and he dies because of this plan. And the end result of the book of, of Esther was that the Jews were given. They didn't turn down, the, they didn't, he couldn't stop the decree, but he made it possible for them to defend themselves. And in that process, uh, they actually killed and destroyed the Amalekites. Now, this is a really interesting side note in this story. I don't know if you're aware of this, but way back in when, the, when King Saul was the first king of Israel, and he was given a command by God to destroy the Amalekites, all of them, everything, every last thing, child, children, everyone be destroyed. But he didn't fulfill that completely. He spared a couple, and there were descendants of the Amalekites that God had decreed had to be destroyed for the wickedness. Haman was an Amalekite. And hundreds of years later, God fulfills this promise that, they, that this people need to be destroyed because of their wickedness. There's some great lessons in that. We'll come to that in a minute. I'm sorry I'm going so quickly on this one, but I hope you un just get this picture of this courageous lady who understood her calling, as especially it came to light why 
God had placed her to be queen at this time and place. She understood her calling. She had the conviction, trust in God to go through with it and the courage to carry out with it, even at great risk to her own life. And because of her, the Israeli people were spared and were able to defend themselves. That was God's way of saving them. To our knowledge, Esther finished well. There's no indication otherwise that she finished well. But the lessons out of the story of Esther, tremendous courage, put aside her well-being for her people, the great evidence of what living by faith looks like, and then just what I mentioned, this importance of understanding God's timeline is different than our timeline. So I want to come back to the question I asked a little bit earlier. Um, are, you, are you at peace with God's, that God has called you for a purpose for this time and place? You know, and it's only a question really you can answer because I believe God has a call in every one, one of you. If you're a child of God, he has a call and place in your life that he wants to use you to accomplish it for his purposes for you this time on your life. Just like Esther was called. Now, hers is very dramatic. It's filled with danger. It was filled with her having to decide, am I going to do this or not? And her obedience and putting her own safety aside to do what God called her. And that letter to, gave, gave her the courage to do what was right. But I think we have to come back and always ask the question, for ourselves is, am I at am I peace that I'm where God wants me to be? Do you know why it's so important to know that? Because if you are at peace that you're where God has called you to be, whatever you do here, and I don't know what you do, and you know you're where God calls you to be, that should give you confidence and courage to live your faith in the place that God's called you to be. And don't second guess. If we're always wondering, well, I wonder if I'm where God wants me to be, then ask God to show you, am I supposed to change or do something differently? But if you know, settle that. And then give yourself wholeheartedly to whatever you are called to do right now and live that for him. And it's when we do that, I believe we fulfill the thing that God has in mind for us. But sometimes we, we wrestle with that too much. I know too many people who wrestle with God's call. You say, well, I don't know. Well, are you, are you supposed to be a farmer? You know that? Then be a farmer for Jesus. You're not a second-class citizen if you're in business or that. Sometimes we think, well, the pastor, the missionary, although they're, they're, they're first-class citizens in God's work, and people who work in the secular workforce are second-class. <laughs> There's no difference between secular and sacred. It's all sacred. And wherever God's called you to be, be that for him. And Esther just modeled that in a very, very tough situation. Any thoughts or do you want to add to that? Does this, this is this making sense why it's so important for us to, to grasp this? I think it, it was that that's a really good way to look at it because that was the expression of their faith they had such a deep trust in God that they weren't going to be wavering and I think it, it it pushes us to ask that question about ourselves do I have a, that kind of faith in God that I can trust him with what's going on and each of you have your own stories your own journeys hardships whatever but can I really trust God? Because I think that they just absolutely showed that depth of faith in God that kept them from wavering. And my, my encouragement to all of us is let's, if we're not, we're struggling with that, but we come back and say, is my faith where it should be? Or do I need to come back to the word and be reminded of God's promises, his goodness? And this is why I think that last, that little note there, God's sovereignty evident in Haman's death God's timeline is not our timeline. This is hundreds of years after that he fulfilled that promise. And God is at work doing his own things. He doesn't follow the timeline. We like to see immediate reaction, or action, don't we? Ask God, we want to see it right now. 
And actually, God often doesn't answer quickly. But it doesn't change the fact that he answers prayers, that he is in control. He's leading, guiding every aspect of our lives. And he will accomplish his purposes. And someday, we're going to spend eternity with him. We can't even really understand heaven, can we? The Bible gives us insight into it. But I think it's so amazing beyond anything we can think or imagine. Oh, this, is, this is what we strive for, that we will spend eternity with him, but to serve him faithfully today, that we don't have regrets of how we serve him now. And be faithful to him, know that we'll finish well as these two characters show us so well in the depth of their faith. And sometimes we have to say, God, help me to grow in my understanding of faith because we're troubled and, and Satan loves to deceive us and make us think wrong things. But let's not listen to those lies. Let's be absolutely convinced and know that God is in control and he will accomplish us his purposes. He will. And that's an absolute assurance. Any final comments on this before we move on to the next one? Okay, let's look at John the Baptist. Again, I'm going quite quickly through these. Um, one of my favorite Bible characters is John the Baptist. I don't know if you, if you remember or recall how he's described. He must have been an odd-looking fella. <laughs> he really... I, wouldn't it be nice to see a picture of him? <laughs> I just wonder what this guy looked like. Wandering out, eating locusts and stuff that he did. But <laughs> he, he is just one of these people... I think that should just speak to us and say, this is a man who knew his calling, and it started in the womb. It started in the womb. Do you recall in the verses up here, in Luke chapter 1, 39, when, when Mary and Elizabeth come together, and, and this is going to be the mother of Jesus, and what, is, what, is, what happens to the baby in Elizabeth? The baby leaps. By the way, great argument against anybody who likes to say abortion is, is, is right. Because this baby was already understanding that his call was going to be to introduce the Savior. He was going to lead, pave the way for Jesus. And he understood that and he did it so well. And he's got some wonderful life lessons for us. So there's different passages we can look to that we're introduced to. But I'm going to just turn to John chapter 3, 21 to 36. And we're going to read there. And I'm going to, there's a couple other passages that I want, to, I want to read to you, but we're going to focus on that one specifically. Uh, John chapter 20, or sorry, chapter 3. Would somebody like to read that? We'll read uh, 22 to 36. <laughs> Because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. How far? Uh, John was 30, uh, 36, right to the end of the chapter. Right the yeah. then, those, then there arose a dispute among them from John, from John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, whom you have testified, behold, he is baptized, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourself bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride in the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him rejoicing greatly, because of the bridegroom's voice, therefore this joy of mine fulfilled, fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. And he who comes from above is above all. He who is of earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. <coughs> he who comes from heaven is above all, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certify that God is true, for even God has sent, speaks the word of God, for God does not get the Spirit by measure. 
Father loves the Son and is, uh, has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. John, we talked about this in my leadership class a little bit this morning. John is paving the way for Jesus to be introduced into his ministry. That was his calling. He understood it. Now think about this. Jesus is now coming on the scene. His public ministry is starting to grow. And the crowds are starting to follow Jesus. And what's happening? John's, the people are following John and all following Jesus. Now would you be a little choked about that? It from a really human perspective? People are leaving me to follow him? Really? It probably would bother most people to see that happening, wouldn't it? And that can play itself in all kinds of scenarios, doesn't it? Loyalties. But this is why we get such an amazing, to me, amazing picture of John's understanding of his calling. He said, it was never about me. It was all about him. It's about me preparing the way and that he gets the glory for what is going on here. And when his disciples came, he said, no, I'm rejoicing that they're going to him. He wasn't threatened. He must increase. I must decrease. You want to keep perspective in life in terms of your Christian walk, pray that. It's a leadership principle. It's a daily Christian principle. Just remind me, it is not about me. God, that you increase because we want to think about ourselves so often, don't we? And John just laid this beautiful picture out. And I love the imagery. He says there, uh, so the one who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears and rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. I was sharing this morning, being at a Bible college, we, we get invited to quite a few weddings. It's one of those things that happens at Bible school. <laughs> and we, we've tried to guess how many we've invited to over the years. Like It's got to be 200 plus now, I'm guessing. I don't know for sure. And we've attended maybe about half of them. And, and I was saying this morning, you know, all the years that I've gone to these weddings, I've never seen the groomsman or the best man jump in front of the bridal couple, hey, hold on, this is about me. This is not about them. <laughs> no, you're standing beside because you're celebrating that couple. That picture, that imagery that they're celebrating. And he kind of uses this imagery, doesn't he, to help us see that he's just celebrating. He's so happy because he understood God's call in his life. Oh, what a lesson for us. If we ask the hard question about ourselves, are we celebrating because we want God to get the glory for everything we do? And when our selfishness kicks in and we want to be recognized, we want people to notice us for things that we've done, we have to back this truck up they know the only thing that matters is that God gets the glory. And that's just, that is John the Baptist's legacy, I think. And he was faithful to the end. Let me read a couple things to you here to hear before we look at the lessons. The death, he, did, he died a martyr's death, not a pleasant one, really disgusting, actually. And it seems strange to us, why did God allow him to die this way? But this is how he died. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard from, about the fame of Jesus and said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized, this is a story here, for Herod had seized John, bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him as a prophet. But when Herod's death or birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give, him whatever, give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was sorry because of his oaths and his guests, and, he, and his guests, he commanded it. Oh, sorry, the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. That was the story, the end of John the Baptist. Kind of strange to us, isn't it, that this would happen to him? It just sounds so gross. But you know, he was a martyr 
who died for the cause he believed in, never wavered. But there's one moment here that I think it's a lesson that we, we, we can take from John the Baptist as well. When we look at the lessons, we know that same theory, that understanding, I'm called to have the conviction that God is in control, then that will give me the courage to do what he's called me to do. That played itself out in John again, just as it did in the previous ones we talked about. And we know he finished well. But the lessons and the takeaway from John the Baptist are this. He demonstrated an incredibly godly perspective. He must become greater. I must become less. And it was not about him. It was about us. And I said, takeaway, critical takeaway. If we get this, we're in a good place in our walk with God. Because our selfishness wants to just cut in all the time, doesn't it? And we need to just say, God, help me that we put you first and it's not about me. But here's a lesson I think we can learn from, from John that shows a side of him. In, in Matthew chapter 11, let me just read this to you. He too had questions and he didn't understand. He started to wonder, am I actually, is this actually the Christ? Like, is this, what's going on here? And this is the question he said here in chapter 11. And when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who has come or shall we look for another? In prison, he started to show some doubt. I wondered, Is that, did I get this wrong? And you know, can you, and I think it's a reminder, even this, this man of faith, this man who, who understood his calling so well, came up with, came, started to have some doubts. Do we struggle with that sometimes? God, what's going on here? I, is this for sure? Is this for real? And then Jesus assures him, and he says, and Jesus answered them, go tell, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who's not offended by me. And he assures him, yes, I'm the one. And he was doing, he had introduced the Savior. He said, it's okay. Let's hear that voice when we struggle with doubt. Where we need to hear Jesus say, listen, it's okay. You may not understand everything that's going on right now. But trust me, because I am with you. I'm going before you. And he did that for John. And the last one again, he understood his calling. And it was to point people to Jesus. By the way, that was John's specific calling, introducing Jesus. But I think we're all called, are we not? To point others to Jesus. So that we are active witnesses in the, in the sur surroundings of the people we interact with that we care enough to share the gospel with them. How many times do we miss that opportunity? I mean, I'll be the first to say, and I know there's been times when God prompts me I'll see somebody say, you need to talk to that person. You just know it's the Spirit of God. And I just, and I, I get scared and I just want to do it. And I've passed on opportunities. And then there's times I've listened. And I'm trying to make it the regular response. <laughs> I was just flying back from Kelowna from the school in, in Sunny Bray. When I find the plane, uh, I pray, Lord, I don't know who I'm going to sit by, but if you want me to talk to them, I'm going to be ready to talk to them. And how many opportunities I've had to share the, the gospel or to talk about faith issues with somebody. And sometimes you just know it's not going to happen. And then other times, this time I have to be sitting with two ladies. And I said, how did I get a conversation going with them? Because they're chit-chatting about different stuff. And then I find, yes, what gives you purpose in life? And then you find out how absolutely empty their lives are where they find their purpose. And the one lady knew the gospel. I could tell she knew it. She said she just categorically decided, I don't want it for me. So it really didn't go anywhere. But the opportunities are everywhere. And we need to ask God, help me to be obedient, to, to not be afraid. We sometimes think we have to say it all right. And we fumble over what we want to say. Cause we, but we, if we care for the salvation of people, we need to ask God, help me to have the courage to speak to this person. And it may just be a seed that's planted. You may be the one who gets to lead that person to Christ. We don't know how God takes these conversations. But I think we've been modeled by, especially look at John, his clear commitment to doing what God called him to do, 
to point people to Jesus. We need to point people to Jesus as well. And let's pray that God will give us those opportunities and be obedient to do it and ask us to be used by him to make a difference in other people's lives. I was on one plane one time. <laughs> this is a quick side story. And, uh, and uh, two stewardesses actually came, sat beside me, and immediately the earbuds went in. I thought, oh, so much for any conversation. These guys, it was from Toronto. And I thought, this is over. But my son was traveling, so I said, oh, do you like traveling? I think I asked her something like that. And, oh, and then she started conversing. She was flying with Sunwing, by the way. Um, kind of not great news right now. She was catching a flight with WestJet for Air Canada, I can't remember. And we start talking, just a, interest about traveling. And then that I was a Christian. I told these people I was a Christian. And she says, can you tell me what the connection is between the Old Testament and the New Testament? <laughs> you want an invitation to share the gospel. That was it right there. And I don't know what happened to that conversation. But I was able to explain the gospel to her. But he, that's what God kind of opened those doors. But I'll tell you, I've missed way too many to my regret. And I'm praying I'll have the courage when God clearly tapped me, you need to talk to that person. I have the courage to do that. Any things to comment on John before we go to one more? Go to our last one. Stephen is another interesting one. Remember, all these people we're talking about gave evidence of a, a faith from the beginning to the end, being faithful. And this is to encourage us to stay the course. So now we're in the book of Acts when we're introduced to Stephen. And uh, he died at a young age. I'm not sure how old he would have been. But if you turn to Acts chapter 6, we'll see the introduction to him. And Acts, they're, they're, remember the church is just getting organized after Christ has gone back to heaven. And the disciples are now taking the lead in the church and they're developing the church. And then it says here in chapter 6, it said, In those days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen. And I underline this in my Bible, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And Philip and Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, and Parmius, Parmenus, and Nicholas, a proselyte, proselyte of Antioch, and these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on them. Now, that's the introduction to Stephen and these other people. But Stephen is singled out as a man filled with the Spirit. So I think one of the things we sometimes don't pay enough attention to, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit of God? And the Bible talks about be filled with the Spirit. We're, we're, it's, when, we, when we accept Christ... The Spirit of God indwells us and, and He secures us as a child of God. But to walk in the Spirit is a daily invitation to the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us and to fill us so that the fruits of the Spirit that are talked about in Galatians come out of us. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness. We want to know how we're doing if we're walking in the Spirit. Go to that list and walk through and say, how's my love for people? Am I being kind to people? Am I being long-suffering? Self-control? It's a good diagnostic of how we're doing spiritually. So Stephen is known as a man filled with the Spirit. Well, shortly after this, he's seized by the Pharisees, the religious leaders. And then he goes on this preaching rant with them. I don't know if rant's the right word. <laughs> but it must have been quite a scene. The courage for him to go, and starting in verse 7, he takes them, takes them through the whole history of God's goodness to them and what he's done from way back to the very beginning. Brothers and 
and brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham, and he goes right back to Abraham, and he walks him through all the miracles and things that God has done. Now, we're going to jump way ahead because it's a long passage. He must have been passionate, but I tell you, they were not happy with him when he was done. Because listen to this. As he gets to the end of it, uh, I'll start in verse 49. Or for, uh, sorry, 48. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophets say, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? And then he, he's very pointed here now with them. He says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You have received the law as delivered by the angels and did not keep it. Oh, is he pointed. He is not being around the bush. This is not politically correct. If you're worried about political correctness, this is not politically correct. He's going right to the point. But there's something about Stephen I want you to catch that is an incredible indication of his who he was as a person and his walk with God. So now listen to this. And when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. I'm trying to envision what that looked like. They were so infuriated with him, grinding their teeth, wanting, they, they hated him so badly. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God but they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul, who became Paul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he'd said this, he fell asleep. I think... We need to take something from this, what a spirit-filled life looks like. That he could say that these people were stoning him to death, even though he was so firm with them and so direct in calling them back to righteousness. And he didn't beat around the bush. He was not politically correct. But to be able to say that he could still love these people because he was spirit-filled. Oh, there's a huge message for us in this to ask the question, am I living a spirit-filled life? And I believe, based on what the scripture says, it's a daily come to the Lord, ask the spirit of God to fill us, to control us, because we can push him off. And we, can do, and we can ignore the spirit of God because we don't want to hear what he's saying. But we invite the spirit. When the Bible says be filled with the spirit, it's a decision we can make to ask him to fill us, to control the different vices and things that come in our life that want to destroy us. And the reality of him being known as once filled with the Spirit is revealed in how he responded. That this was the real deal. This was no fake. And as a young man, he's martyred. And of course, those are pretty familiar words at the end, isn't there? When we, Jesus, Jesus responds even to those who killed him. And I just, when I look at the life of Stephen, it, to me it's like, wow, we better learn from this man. And he gives us practical living tools right now. We may never be martyred for our faith. We never face what he faced. But I know this. We have to have the courage to walk in the Spirit of God and say, the Spirit, help me. And then as the Spirit works in us, he helps to reveal those things in us that we need to change. Vices or sins that maybe we're not encountering or dealing with and helps us to confront those. And then we walk in the control of the Spirit of God instead of our flesh. You know, when Galatians talks about the fruit of the flesh, it's just not a pretty sight. I think you, you, you have heard that list. It's not a pretty sight. And he says, but be walking the Spirit. And he gives the, all these lists of things of what walking Spirit looks like, which, like I said, Stephen modeled that and revealed what it means to walk in the Spirit. I don't know. What do you think? Any questions or insights to add to this? Do you understand the value of this example? Like we're just scratching the surface. I, and I don't know if I'm doing it the right way. Maybe I should go deeper with this, but 
I'm just trying to draw key lessons from each of these characters. Are we getting this? Do you understand the importance of it? I mean, this is convicting every time I teach this for me to remind myself, am I walking day by day in the Spirit? I was talking to my friend Arnie Armstrong. Some of you, I think, heard him teach maybe. Um, <laughs> so we were talking about this, and he said we can be out in front of people and living, you know, doing the day-to-day activities and put on a, you know, walk in the Spirit because we're committed to it. And then we go home and we're rude to our wife. Is that the fruit of the Spirit? No, it is not. It means we have now switched to walking in the flesh. And so we're, no matter what the circumstances, whether it's where we're guarded, where we're paying more attention to it, where our guard comes down, we need to ask the Spirit of God to fill us that we walk in the Spirit and demonstrate that to the people we live and work with and, and, and love. So great lesson. He showed what a Spirit-filled life, life looks like and the transforming power of the gospel and just to, just to comment, it starts, I believe, in understanding the gospel in your life, that Jesus Christ came, he came and took our sins on his behalf, that if we believe in him, he took our sins upon himself, and if we believe in him, we will, we will become his, ch- his children, and we will have life and have it abundantly, abundantly. The Christian life should not look like you've been packed into a pickle jar. That should not be what people see. People should see the joy of the Lord coming out of us. That's what the, jo- the Spirit of God gives us, a joy and a peace that, that really can only come from the genuine relationship and the control of the Spirit in our relationship with Jesus because of the gospel. Beautiful. It really shows the Spirit's power to little convictions, and he, he held his conviction and came, gave him the courage to speak the way he did, to die the way he did. I think there's something in this too, the blunt in telling the truth, and yet he showed God's love. And sometimes we skirt around the issue so much that we don't call sin for what it is, and we need to be upfront. Tomorrow we're going to talk about David and Nathan and how Nathan came along beside David, but he was very pointed in telling David, you have sinned. And sometimes in dealing with sin, we have to be clear, this is sin, and we need to deal with it. If it's important to you, you need to respond to that. And then we live in a, a society, of course, with obsession with political correctness. It's a strange thing. And those of you older, I don't know what, no matter what age you are, will know this is a powerful force in our country. And it's not about being a jerk, but we skirt around the issues so much that we can't even talk normally because somebody might be offended. But the gospel is actually offensive. And Jesus was very clear, they're going to hate you for my name's sake. And I used to bother me. I was in university, I remember, and I, it was just like open season on Christianity. Like they, they could just ridicule Christians anytime they wanted. They wouldn't talk about their faith the same way. They were scared to, I think. But Christians, open season, used to just bug me. That's not fair. And all of a sudden, the light went on. That's what I signed on for. That's exactly what I signed on for. And I have to be okay with that. That if I'm going to be a, a, a Christian and be visible Christian, I'm going to take ridicule sometimes for that. And it's going to come with suffering because Jesus said this is part of the deal. And are we going to have the courage, even in the time of suffering and ridicule, to stay the course? And we're going to have to have the courage to stand up to lots of stuff that's surfacing in our world today. Any questions or thoughts before I start to wind this down? Like Stephen called the person out to be stiff neck in person or when are we gentle? Well, you know, that is a really good question. And I think we have to ask God to show us how to respond in the situation. Because sometimes, I don't think, like in his case, he's preaching to or he's, you know, he's really confronting a whole crowd. And so that context has its own context. You're one-on-one with somebody, and we'll learn this tomorrow, that it's important to call sin for what it is and not beat around the bush. We don't want to try to circle this plane, be so diplomatic. They don't, what are you talking about? No, you've sinned. 
but to do it in a tone, I think, that genuinely loves the person and cares, but also is pointed. Because I don't think, if we're not pointed, we don't get it. So a lot of people don't get it. And then they still have to make the decision whether I'm going to listen, that rather than deal with the sin that is being confronted. And tomorrow, that, if there's a real good process how you can do that, we'll talk about that tomorrow. But I think it really requires prayer to know when do you have to be really upfront and when do you just use gentleness? And the Bible is very clear that gentleness is the best way to go in most cases. Is that gentle spirit that comes to somebody and says, I care enough about you to talk to you because I see something that's destroying you. Are you going to listen? I'll, I'll talk about that more tomorrow. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's a hard one. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts? The scene I got where they, you know, kill Stephen, and he's very upfront. Uh, I'll just read this. And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you have become prepared to be murdered. We have received the law by the direction of angels who have not kept it. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. You know, the uh, brutality of our sinful nature comes to mind when I see this. I mean, stoning someone, killing someone, and witnessing all of that, it's gross. But that happens. I mean, we see it now even in Ukraine and Russia. Just the brutality of it. Yeah, and I think it, it is just a reminder how deep sin takes us, our depravity, and... You know, I, I think I shared this this morning in my leadership class, but we, we have to pray often that God will help us to see sin for what it really is. It always looks worse than somebody else, doesn't it? Or generally, how can you do that? But when you're working through the same issues, maybe it's not so big a deal. And we have to have God help me to see sin for how bad it really is and help me not to cushion it and soften it and out of that produces the kind of behavior, the extent that it can go, the hatred and the depth of the heart, to go to that extent that brutalizes and kills people. But then it's our own confronting with our own hearts, like what do we do with this? And are we willing to repent when we know something's off so that we can receive God's forgiveness? Thank you, that's, that's really good. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to this one as we close. This is just some things that I want to encourage you with. When I think of Bible characters, I think of these people we've just talked about very, very briefly, but their examples or testimonies of starting well, finishing well, strong in their convictions. They knew the truth. They were committed to the truth of, of the Scriptures. They were committed to truth, God's truth, and it gave them the courage to do what they're supposed to do. But there are things surfacing in our world that we have to be really alert to that I think will attack us if we're not careful and wise. And I'm just going to comment briefly on this, but just to give you the heads up, again, you may be well-versed in this. I have no idea. But I would just encourage you, in the journey of finishing well, these are things that are tearing Christians away and destroying Christians, I believe, are destroying their faith, taking them away from a close walk with God. This is, this is just specific movements or trends that are happening. So critical issues like impacting Christians, progressive Christianity. Progressive Christianity is a false gospel. Um, it, it discredits the Bible as the final authority. They pick and choose what they want out of this and create their own morality. It shouldn't give you a lot of confidence, right, if I create my morality because I don't believe this is the final authority. And what they do, for example, I was explaining to, I think, to Peter, they will take the atonement, for instance. So the atonement is the foundational aspect of the gospel. Jesus becoming our atonement. Him dying on the cross for us, taking his blood shed for us that we might have salvation. And progressive Christians will say, will call that cosmic child abuse. God would never do that. And that is heresy. Because they're influenced by culture that's influenced by wokeness, which has this hypersensitivity to justice, that you just can't do stuff like that. 
And it's, it's an insidious evil, by the way. But anyway, so, and then uh, they don't believe in hell. They've rationalized hell away. Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. Boy, don't kid yourself. I don't know how they do it. I just don't get it. But if this is not the authority, I'll, I'll come up with whatever I want anyway. Be careful with that. Critical race theory, Black Lives Matter, the LGBTQ+, wokeness. These are powerful movements in our schools and starting in our churches. And, it, and I, I did some teaching on this with the students, but I'm telling you, as I look at this, I can't find one redeeming quality in any of these things. And this is what churches are trying to do. Well, there's some aspects that are nice. No, actually, no. You go to the foundation of these beliefs. Every one of these beliefs, critical race theory, for instance, like all of them have their origin in Marxism. And Marxism defies the authority of Scripture and the authority of God. That's the premise that they're all built off. Every one of these is built off of that premise. Wokeness is the umbrella. Are you familiar with the term wokeness? Okay. Okay, so it's, it's, a, uh, it, 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 it's an extreme hypersensitivity to justice. But it's a weird kind of thing because then you can justify, uh, so in critical race theory, the only people capable of racism are white people. That's how it's defined in university. You don't, like, you don't define racism now as a human condition. It's a white condition. Because we have to make up what are the perceived injustices done to different races over the generations. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and beware. Yeah, it's very bad. Beware of it. Don't be scared of it. But I think you nailed it. And because that's, it's permeating everything. And that's why you're not allowed to say that homosexuality is a sin and call it sin. Or this sexual behavior is sin or this kind of mindset or whatever the venue happens to be because that's just being completely unjust. But the Bible is pretty clear on what's sin and what isn't sin. And we need to call it. It doesn't mean treating people poorly. That's not what this is about. But it's taking a stand and saying this is wrong. We know, like as a school, and I'll speak from the school's perspective, we've already decided very definitively where our flag is planted in all these, these issues. So that if the government or somebody comes to say, you can't teach that anymore, we've already said, no, we are not, we are not, we will because this is our conviction. And churches are going to be facing this more and more as government puts pressure on to just accept everybody. It sounds so good, doesn't it? Accept everybody. What it's talking about, it's not accepting the, a person in the image of God. It's accepting behavior that's ungodly. Yes, and accepting everybody's own truth. Exactly. And there's no such thing as absolute truth. What I believe can be my truth. What you believe can be your truth. And it's all... <laughs> it just it is just a it's an ugly thing and I, I i wanted to bring this up because i believe this is one of the things that if we're not on guard as christians is going to take us away from finishing well there's many many things but this is a growing force in the school system and university in government oh we have a very woke government in trudeau he is woke to the core biden is woke to the core i mean it's, it permeates everything because how they view and how they view justice has nothing to do with morality. It has a, it's a skewed view of justice. And uh, anyway, beware.
Here's, a, here's one I will tell you if you want to really get an understanding of some of these issues. This is a really good book. It's less than a year old by Erwin Lutzer. It says, No Reason to Hide. He does a really good job of explaining these issues. Uh, take a picture of it, order if you want. If you want to be informed, read it because it's really helpful. And I like how he does it because he has a kindness to it. It's not just hammering everybody such jerks. That doesn't accomplish things either. What he does is he just tells the truth and he presents this in a way that I think a Christian responds to these issues. But it helps us to be informed and guarded. This is kind of, sorry, I got a little bit of a tangent on this one, but the bigger issue is this is an example of things that dis can destroy our relationship with God if we're not careful. We can bind to saying, well, it makes sense. Every step is one step away from the truth until there's a full embracing of, the, of these things. So. so if you want this, this is a great one of progressive. It's called the Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity. And what it does is it counters the, their top ten reasons of what they believe, why they believe what they believe. And then this is on the whole woke culture. Anyway, I think that's good. Thank you for your attention. And it's, it's, I really appreciate you taking the time. And I hope my prayer has been that God will just bless you and encourage you where you need to be encouraged through these discussions. I know we just barely scratched the surface. I hope I haven't gone too quickly. I feel like I maybe rushed a little bit. <laughs> but I, I hope you got the essence of these lessons that come out of these characters. I'll pray and then we can be done. Lord, thank you for the beauty of your word. It is true completely from start to finish. It is your inspired word. Help it to be, help us to embrace it as your, the, the full counsel for all of life and practice, completely trustworthy. And as we look at these people who, by your sovereign sifting and inspiration, place these characters for us to read about and learn from them, help us to take these lessons and apply them to our lives, to learn what we can learn, what we need to change, where we can be encouraged to keep forward with what you're doing. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for this church and this community. Would you bless and guide and there just be a focus on you in all of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen.